what I have for you this week is an interesting case from about Sparelli in Spain, Supreme Court 2020. And it also involves a brand they used to have called Playtex. Uh, here you can see the court decision. It is from the Supreme Court in Madrid. It is a 2020 case. Uh, caveat, my Spanish is limited to about 2000 words and Google Translate is not perfect when it comes to court decisions. So I may get one or two details wrong here, but please feel free to correct me in the comments. So we're talking about Article 9.1 the transfer pricing article in the model convention, which says where conditions are made between two parties, which differ from those which would be made between independent enterprises, any profits which would have accrued to one of those enterprises may be included in the profits of that enterprise and tax accordingly, if it hasn't done so because of transfer pricing. Question is, does an article 9.1 adjustment always have to be a transfer pricing adjustment. A 10 second commercial. If you want to learn more about international taxation or transfer pricing or treat yourself to an all round update, or if you want your team to learn or stay updated, please visit my online courses. Um, so that's the question that the Supreme Court answered here effectively for the second time because there was a 2012 case where they already said, yes, we can, but Sarah Lee challenged that case and said there were 16 cases which said, no, you can't. Um, so let's see what happened. You have Sarah Lee Corp in the US and it had a Dutch subsidiary, which uh, I'm just trying to get a pointer here, but it does, there we go, which had a Spanish subsidiary. And this is one we're talking about, Sarah Lee Southern Europe which had a group of Fiscal 3490. I'm not sure whether this refers to a Spanish article or whether that was the name of the group or whether you can even do consolidated groups in Spain. And they had a Italian subsidiary, SL, Sperceira Li, I assume, HNBC, SPA, um, with a historic acquisition price of 62.5 million. We can leave that one for now. It will play later. And then what happened was in 2000, Sara Lee decided to do a reorganization. And first there was another subsidiary, which was held by the Dutch company called Sara Lee Invest International. And that acquired various subsidiaries, I believe against the issues of shares um, <clears throat> in Portugal, Italy, and Greece. Sarah, uh, there was also another company called SL Finance Luxembourg, which lent uh, money to, to, to Sara Lee Southern Europe at 8.35%. It was a 50 plus year loan and then and, and, and the interest would be adjusted every, every um, 10 years. Uh, 8.35 seems like a lot, but what they acquired was various subsidiaries, both for the issue of shares and for debt. And the 636 million debt came from SL Finance Luxembourg. And then in, in, in 2001, around June, um, Sara Lee Investments was transferred to Sara Lee Southern Europe and it was then merged into Sara Lee Southern Europe. So Sara Lee Southern Europe now became the shareholder of these various uh, Portuguese, Italian and Greek subs. And then in 2004, there was a debt restructuring of Sara Lee BA in Italy, Serbia, a brand apparel, and this is where the Playtex brand comes in. And that was a, a, a full subsidiary or nearly 100% subsidiary, I believe, of uh, Sara Lee branded apparel in, Spa, in, in, in France. So, it was, so the Playtex um, division was a completely independent division, except it was not very profitable in Italy. And at the end of 2003, uh, the Italian subsidiary had 57 million euros in losses and they agreed at a shareholders meeting to reduce the share capital from 65 million to 8 million i assume to account for these losses and then another million came from 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 the capital that it had already now 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 do pay attention here at this moment the, the italian subsidiary is a french problem right because spain is not involved in this at all but then 
uh, it was decided that Sara Lee should uh, should put 20 million euros in capital into into the Italian subsidiary in exchange for more than 50 percent of the share. So now Spain gets involved. We're going to take away the other part of the structure because that's not relevant anymore from this point onwards. Um, we'll get back to it when we look at the court decisions. And in 2004, we also get between uh, March and, and October that, uh, that Sara Lee uh, acquires all the shares in the Italian subsidiary for 20 million euro payment to the French company. So the French company now is completely out of the problem, out of the structure and Sara Lee in Spain is having the Italian company. And I assume that part of the issue here was that the French company could not depreciate on its subsidiary, just like Sara Lee also borrowed money to acquire the other subsidiaries um, that we looked at in the previous slide. Uh, I assume that Spain allowed for interest deductions on this 8.35% loan, which the Dutch presumably did not do anymore. Or Sara Lee in, in Spain was simply too profitable and they had to erode the tax base. There, there, there must have been some kind of reason behind this. And then finally, in December 2004, um, there was another capital increase in, in, in Sierra Leone branded apparel Italy um, through an $81 million loan, which was which originally was held by Sierra Leone DNV, but then got uh, transferred to Sierra Leone Southern Europe uh, 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 against debt or against capital contribution. I, 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 I'm not sure. And then finally, in May, the uh, the other Italian sub, they don't say what the market value was at the time, was transferred to Sara Lee branded apparel as well to help prop up this company's losses, one would assume. So if we look at the complete structure, uh, then, then it's very clear before Sara Lee in Spain had its own subsidiaries and everything and nothing strange was going on. And the Italian sub that was making losses was primarily a French problem from a shareholder point of view. And afterwards, France is completely out of the picture. And Sara Lee Spain now paid France 20 million for the, for the remaining shares of, of Italy, pumped in 20 million in capital to, 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 to uh, this uh, Italian subsidiary to pump up its capital, then took over a loan of 81 million from the Dutch company, and then also transferred a company with the historic cost value of 62.5 million to the Italian company. Um, if you read the, the, the text carefully, they did in the end manage to sell this Italian company. Um, they don't say, but they, they don't give further detail in the case itself, whether it was part of a larger sale, whether it was, I think it was all, the whole Playtex group was transferred out of the Sierra Leone group. But as one can imagine, the French authorities were not very happy with us, right? I mean, Sierra Leone Southern Europe made an accounting provision for depreciation of the securities in the Italian subsidiary for 51 million euros for 2005 and six, of which 51.1 million was adjusted positively for tax purposes, and the other 51 million was deducted for tax purposes. And the tax authorities then struck, uh, struck back and they said on, on October 2012, a settlement agreement was issued regarding the corporation tax for five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, all the way to nine, and it concerned um, resulting in a debt to be paid of 50, uh, 49 million euros um, with the installment of 39 million in the first in case uh, of taxes and, and, and almost 9 million in interest. And, and the breakdown was by years as uh, shown here. And the, the adjustments carried out in the, in the settlement um, <clears throat> were, 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 were for, for the following two things. One, the non-tax deductibility of certain financial expenses for internal loans for the internal acquisition of shares in other group companies. So, the, so I assume this is this payment, the, the, this loan to Luxembourg at 8.35% that the Spanish authorities simply said, you know what, that loan and the interest is not deductible because the group already had these subsidiaries. So why did you move them other than for tax reasons, right? And the second one, obviously, was the inadmissibility for allowances for the deducted for the provision of the depreciation of Sara Lee branded apparel SRL. <clears throat> so that was not deductible either. 
And then on 10 May 2013, as a consequence of the foregoing sanctions were imposed of another 8 million. I assume these are simply penalties for, for tax avoidance. Now, Sarah Lee, predictably, was not happy. They appealed and the Supreme Court goes through their appeals. The appeal was done, was run now a couple of years later by Jakob Dauer Egberts, Spain SLU, which I assume was the successor of, of, of the Sarah Lee um, Southern Europe company. And there were two grounds. One violation denounced the appeal and controversial issue from the denunciation. And here we come to Google Translate not being perfect and my Spanish helping a bit, but not a lot. Their first ground was Article 9, one of the agreement between Spain and France in order to avoid double taxation and prevent fraud. Um, uh, th this one was well, was violated. And then also Article 16 of the Consolidated Tax of Corporate Tax Law of Spain was violated. And Article 16 is the transfer pricing law, if I understand things correctly. And, and then the issue here is what the Spanish authorities did was they didn't apply the transfer pricing rules. They simply said, you know what, this transaction is abusive. We've got anti-abuse rules. We can simply disregard the transaction because it is abusive and, 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 and therefore not allow the, the, the deductions of, 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 of interest for these subsidiaries because no one would have bought them at that price, I assume this is the argument, and then also not allow any depreciation of this Italian subsidiary because it was so bad when it was acquired and no one wanted to acquire it. So these were rules outside of the transfer pricing rules and, 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 and the taxpayer says, well, you should use the transfer pricing rules, right? In this regard, the appeal points out that the object, the object of discussion is whether the operations carried out by Sierra Leone Southern Europe um, were made under market conditions and whether the inspection action was in accordance with the law since the inspection did not apply Article 16, i.e. the Spanish transfer pricing rules. That was their first argument. And the second one, had to do with this case that I referred to, these cases in 2012, where the Supreme Court already said you could deduct, that you could apply other rules than transfer pricing rules under Article 9. And then in 16, the court said, no, you can't. But what the Supreme Court in this particular case said is, you know what, the, the, the case in 12 was not about valuing the, um, the, the, the transaction, it was about recognizing congestion, yes or no, whereas in 16, the cases really was about what the value of the, of the transactions were, and therefore we, do, we, 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 we said that you must look at transfer pricing rules in 16, right? So um, the, 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 the taxpayer concluded his argument saying that all this entails the necessary preparation of a comparability analysis for the determining whether A, an operation has been carried out in the same market conditions by interrelated parties, right? And if so, what the scope for eventual deviation is. So if we didn't use the arm's length price, how far are we off? And and, and what I like about this argument, I mean, there's something sweet about it. This is litigation strategy, right? Because what the taxpayer basically does is it is complaining about the fact that by calling the transaction commercially irrational, I think that's what they do with this, uh, the, the Spanish words are constituyeron una radical simulacion, um, which is Google translates it with something very strange, but uh, a radical simulation, I think they call it. But I think they mean commercially irrational, right? Because uh, they, they call the transaction commercially irrational and they didn't substitute it with another transaction, the tax authorities basically didn't give the taxpayer anything to shoot at, right? Because if they did substitute the transaction for something else, and if they did then make a full comparability analysis and they came to a price, then Sarah Lee could say, well, you did this wrong in the comparability analysis, you did this wrong in the comparability analysis, and therefore the price is too high or too low. But by just saying, you know what, we're ignoring the transactions because this is an anti -abuse, this is an uh, abusive transaction, there's nothing for the taxpayer to shoot at to try and up up or down the, the adjustment, right? So I, I think it's quite sweet. Um, and the Supreme Court has not a lot of time for this. It considers all of this and it said, you know, it should initially be noted that the Spanish-French treaty, as highlighted by its title and the brief exposition that precedes its regulatory part, pursues two purposes of avoiding double tax and preventing tax evasion and fraud. Therefore, Article 9.1 can be used for either of them, including avoiding uh, tax evasion or fraud, right? 
And then they go on and say the foregoing shows that application of Article 9 must be, accompanied, must be accompanied by the application of internal rules, and these may be constituted by Article 16 of the, of, of, of the internal law. So, so what the court does say is, you know what, you, you cannot apply Article 9 one directly because you need legislation to implement the transfer pricing rules, right? I, 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 I think this is an interesting argument. So, so if you were another country, let's say you were Colombia or you were uh, something on the other side of the planet, Hong Kong, um, you can't just apply Article 9.1 if you don't have transfer pricing rules or other rules in place, right? Because the court says Article 10 must be applied. The only thing is the matter, uh, and uh, Article 10 was the anti-abuse rule. So, uh, you know, we, that's what we applied, and the only thing uh, that is um, the only thing that is a matter of contra controversy is the object or the price of, of of these operations. But that was not the case here. <clears throat> but other internal rules, therefore, the court says, will have to be applied when what is discussed is justification of the legal transaction. It's not the price; it's whether a transaction would have happened at all. The answer must be, and the court then goes on to say, you see the Spanish text at the bottom, that the adjustment of the operation between Spanish and French companies through the application of Article 9 can be carried out without the need to resort to, met to the methods provided for determining the market value in related party transactions. So you know, don't need to say which TV method you apply, and you don't need to do your comparability analysis and all those kind of things. So the court logically comes to conclusion that it says that the infractions denounced by the appeal of cassation are not to be appreciated. A Google Translate way of saying, we do not think that the appeal should be honored. And this is because of the following. The main issue in dispute was not the amount. It was whether the transaction, the acquisition of these shares had sufficient justification to be considered credible to make the allocations that had been inducted for depreciation of Sarah Lee branded apparel SRLs. And the tax administration and the judgment under appeal, because this was a lower court judgment which was appealed against, understood that this acquisition lacked justification and only had the purpose of tax avoidance. Therefore, the court says, you know what, we, we, we will not honor the, the, the appeal. They invoked Article 9 uh, 1 to point out that in the circumstance of economic losses, the transaction was not seen between unrelated parties. So it was commercially irrational. And here is the, 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 the Spanish text of, of the final decision. I think this is an interesting decision and it brings up a couple of points. So let's go back to Article 9, right? But we are an enterprise. <coughs> um, uh, where conditions are made yeah, which differ from those which would be made between independent enterprises and any profits which would but for those conditions have accrued to one of the enterprises but by reason of those conditions have not accrued may be included in the profits of that enterprise. Now, can you do this or can't you do this with article, without TP adjustments? One argument to say that you can would be that the commentary in Article 1 encourages use of national anti-abuse rules even within treaties, right? So, so the OECD has taken pains, and it's interesting to read the commentary on Article 1 in this way. They say, you know what, I mean, very often the treaty, if you look at the preamble, and the national rules follow the same um, purpose, and therefore it is okay to apply these, the, these national anti-abuse rules. You're not overriding the treaty, you're sitting within the purpose of the treaty. And this is also what, well, what the preamble says, and then the wording of Article 9 actually allows for it as well, right? Because the wording ultimately says any profits which would have accrued to one of the enterprises may be included in the profits of that enterprise. It, it, it doesn't tell you how, it doesn't say that you must use transfer pricing rules. And if you look at the commentary of Article 9, it very clearly shows that you could also apply thin cap rules under Article 9. It is still allowed. Um, and it even says in the, in, the, in the commentary, you are allowed to recharacterize the loan as something else. Now, if you can recharacterize a loan as not being a loan, then surely you can say we can recharacterize these acquisitions of shares. As, as something else as well. But it does always limit you to, with, to, to, to the confinements of what arm's length profits would have been. And, and here the question really is, you know, should you therefore make a calculation of what the arm's length profit would have been? So maybe Sara Lee did have a point there, but it was not honored by the Spanish court. So the question is, if Spanish law and Spanish courts did enough to ensure that national anti-abuse will stay within the confinements of Article 142 of the Transfer Pricing Guidelines, or whether they even should, right? Um, 
I think in this particular case they did. And, and if we look at Article 142 again, the transaction as accurately delineated may be disregarded. And that's effectively what they did, where the arrangements made viewed in their totality differ from those which would have been adopted by independent enterprises having uh, in behaving in a commercially rational manner in comparable circumstances. And, and you know, one can argue, uh, by the, the, would Spain have acquired an unrelated part where would Spain have acquired these subsidiaries against this $63 million um, or euro loan? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the commercial value of, of those subsidiaries were. Maybe they would have. The question, of course, then would have been, would they, would they have done that against a loan of 8.35%? Um, Please note also that was a 50-year loan, so that was probably for, for, for Luxembourg purposes to make sure that the loan was not treated as a loan, but actually as equity. So when you made interest payments on the loan, it was actually treated as interest in Spain, deductible, but as dividends in Luxembourg pre-BEPS, um, and therefore uh, not subject to tax, right? Now, 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 I'm not sure because we simply don't have enough facts to, to, to know whether the loan was at arm's length or whether the acquisition was at arm's length. The, the court seems to say here in any case, it was not deductible. So maybe the, maybe the acquisition was not, well, was not at arm's length. And then when you look at this particular Italian subsidiary, it is quite clear that, 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 that simply it wasn't at arm's length. You know? and, 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 and the thing about 142 is it says that if the transactions are commercially irrational, you cannot price them because you cannot price an commercially irrational transaction. You know? and, and, and from that point of view, it means that Spain did not have the obligation to try and calculate a price by doing a comparability analysis and picking a method and selecting a price. Right? So um, this whole thing of thereby preventing the determination of a price that would have been that would be acceptable to both parties is, 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 is the guidelines saying, but well, you know what, if the transaction is commercially rational, you can't price it, forget about it. I hope you enjoyed this case. Um, I think it was an interesting one, uh, sitting a little bit in the middle between transfer pricing and international tax, because ultimately it was international tax anti-abuse rules that were, that were applied. And I look forward to discussing another case with you next time. Bye for now.